In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Good morning. Good morning. Today again we hear about King David, who was chosen from among his brothers yesterday in the reading, and today he slays the giant Goliath. So let's begin this Mass by asking God to defend us from the evil one and from sin, and to free us from our sins so that we can worthily celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord, you're sent to heal the contrite. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You plead for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who govern all things, both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Samuel. David spoke to Saul, let your majesty not lose courage. I am your service. I am at your service to go and fight this Philistine. But Saul answered David, <clears throat> you cannot go up against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are only a youth, while he has more has been a warrior from his youth. David continued, The Lord who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear will also keep me safe from the clutches of this Philistine. <clears throat> Saul answered David, Go, the lion will be with you. Then staff in hand, David selected five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in, his po in the pocket of his shepherd's bag. With his sling also ready to hand, he approached the Philistine. With his shield bearer marching before him, the Philistine also advanced closer and closer to David. When he had sized David up and seen that he was youthful and ruddy and handsome in appearance, the Philistine held David in contempt. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with a staff? Then the Philistine cursed David by his gods and said to him, Come here to me, and I will leave your flesh for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David answered him, You come against me with sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel that you have insulted. Today the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will leave your corpse and the corpses of the Philistine army for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Thus the whole land shall learn that Israel has a God. All this multitude, too, shall learn that it is not by sword or spear that God saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will, shall deliver you into our hands. The Philistine then <clears throat> moved to meet David at close quarters, while David ran quickly toward the battle line in the direction of the Philistine. David put his hand into the bag and took out a stone. 
hurled it with the sling, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. <clears throat> the stone embedded itself in his brow, and he fell prostrate on the ground. Thus, David overcame the Philistine with sling and stone. He struck the Philistine mortally and did it without a sword. Then David ran and stood over him with the Philistine's own sword, which he drew from his, its sheath. He dispatched him and cut off his head. The word of the Lord. Amen. The responsorial psalm. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord, <coughs> excuse me. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle, my fingers for war. My refuge and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, who subdues my people under me. O oh God, I will sing a new song to you. With a ten-stringed lyre, I will chant your praise. You who gave victory to kings and delivered David, your servant, from the evil sword. gospel of the kingdom and cured every disease among the people. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. <laughs> Jesus entered the synagogue. There was a man there who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, come up here before us. Then he said to the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil? to save life rather than to destroy it. But they remained silent, looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death. My sisters and brothers, this is the good news, the gospel of the Lord. As you know, we are in the midst of the week of Christ, for Christian unity and we're encouraged to pray for that. The trouble is, if we ever became one, we wouldn't know what to look for. We wouldn't know what to do with it. Because only Jesus can make us one. I think Goliath is alive and well today in the form of all of those forces that come against the church continuously for 2,000 years. Christian unity is not impossible, but it's very hard to achieve because only Jesus can make it happen. Only the Spirit can make it happen. Several years ago, I attended an ecumenical conference in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it was a wonderful experience. We had several Protestant denominations represented and then there were we Catholics. We were the largest contingent 
at this ecumenical conference. We had denominational tracks in the morning, denominational tracks in the afternoon, but the highlight of every day of this gathering was what happened in the evening when we all came together in this huge arena. Didn't worry about denominational differences, didn't worry about theological conflicts. We just focused on Jesus, we prayed in the spirit, and we were one. It was a wonderful experience, I thought. And at the end of the conference, as I was leaving the arena, I noticed a group of people outside the doors and they were passing things out. And I just automatically assumed they were from the conference and they were probably passing out advertisements for their church or their prayer groups or whatever. And a lady came up to me from that body of folks outside and handed me whatever they were passing out, and I didn't even look at it. I thanked her and I said, God bless you, and I went on my way. And after I'd gone on my way a short distance, I looked at what she had given to me, and it was an announcement from a particular church community in Indianapolis assuring us that unless all of us who had attended this ecumenical conference left what we had and joined their church, we were all going to hell. <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, so much for Christian unity. <laughs> In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, and if you remember, John gives us the discourse of Jesus at the Last Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't give us this, but John does. And in the 17th chapter, we have the prayer of Jesus for the church. He's just prayed for all of his disciples there at the time. And he says, I pray also for all of those who will come in the future because of what this immediate group of disciples teach. And then he says these key words, Father, that they may be one, even as you are one, and as, as you and I are one. It's as if Jesus anticipated the struggles that would come in the future to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. And unity is one of the signs of the church that Jesus called into being. We should pray for Christian unity. For a while, ecumenism was a hot topic in the local church and efforts were being made to do things together and so on and so forth, but that seems to have died down in recent years. I always like to think in these terms of a principle of the spiritual life of discipleship that I heard that I think makes a lot of sense. One of the signs of authentic discipleship is when the disciple's heart is grieved by what grieves the heart of Jesus. And I suspect that the disunity in the Christian community to this day grieves the heart of Jesus because he prayed for unity, not disunity. Several years ago, our Bishop Blair at the time followed the lead of Pope St. John Paul II, uh, who had apologized on behalf of the Catholic Church to the Protestant community for all the harm done by Catholics against Protestants over the course of history. And so Bishop Blair decided that would be a good thing to do. We'll do that here in this diocese. So he set up something in the cathedral and invited representatives of the Lutheran community, because that's the, the group that Pope, Pope St. John Paul II had addressed, invited them to come in the cathedral and would celebrate this great moment of Christian unity. And I came to this event, and as I walked into the cathedral, the first thing I noticed was all the Lutherans sat on the right side, and all the Catholics sat on the left side. Nobody mingled together. And we had a nice prayer session, and Bishop Blair, just like Pope John Paul, Saint John Paul II said, 
uh, apologized on behalf of we Catholics uh, for our part in the disunity uh, of the church. And then I was waiting to see somebody from the Lutheran community get up and apologize for their part. Not a single one of them budged. I thought, well, that's interesting. We're not the only ones who are responsible for the divisions of the church, the Christian church. But none of them joined in that prayer. Christian unity, well, let's put it this way, Christian disunity weakens the message. I mean, imagine yourself uh, not being a Christian and hearing various representatives of the different denominations coming to you and saying, no, come to my denomination. We're the only ones that are really true to Christianity. Don't pay attention to the other ones. That'd be kind of a confusing message, wouldn't it? So today we are encouraged, and throughout this entire week, to pray for Christian unity. The Spirit can bring it about. Jesus can bring it about with our cooperation. And only Jesus can do that. What it will look like, we don't know. But if you consider the fact that the major theological differences have all been worked out, but the only thing left to decide on is the role of the Pope. But Jesus can make it happen if we trust him, if we believe in his power. We have in our gospel today a simple little example of the issue of disunity. Here he is in the synagogue doing something they know that the Messiah would do if he ever came into their midst. They just can't wrap their brains around the thought that Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's kid, could possibly be the Messiah. And they watched him heal this man, bring his body to wholeness, and what did they do? They immediately started to plot. And we hear it in this gospel, in order to kill him. He's masquerading. He can't be the Messiah. That's an ultimate example of disunity, if ever there was an example. So today we pray for Christian unity. We pray for the grace to trust our God, that he can lead us to that day. And we pray in thanksgiving, as the, as the church says, there's one church. We happen to be blessed with the fullness of that church. For 2,000 years, Jesus has walked with the church in the most difficult situations, through the most difficult times, has never abandoned us. And that's the only explanation in my mind as to how it could be for 2,000 years, the Catholic Church is still here, is still functioning, is still gathering us together to celebrate the great gift of Jesus in the Eucharist. So today, let's pray that all of us will genuinely intercede before God for the unity of the body of Christ because there's one body, there's one church, there's one Lord, and there's one spirit. God bless you. Let us stand and pray for the church, that the church will be united against evil, against as David slew Goliath, that the church will resist the forces that uh, attack the church, we pray to the Lord. Lord and we pray for um, government leaders that they also will um, defend the rights of the church and human life and marriage and family. We pray to the Lord. Lord and we pray for all those who have died and we pray in this Mass, especially for the repose of the soul of Isaiah Cruz. We pray to the Lord. 
Father, hear the prayers offered at the altar of Christ our Lord, who died for us, but rose and lives forever and ever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, and become for us the bread of life. We have received the wine we offer you. Through the vine and work of human hands, we become our spiritual drink. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O Lord, we pray, that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up. Lord, Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word, through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> you are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Yeah. 
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. <clears throat> Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Myron, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Hmm. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
we have come to know and to believe in the love that God has for us. Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness make those you have nourished by this one heavenly bread, one in mind and heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Eucharistic celebration is ended, <clears throat> so let us go forth now with love and joy to serve the Lord, one another, and all of those to whom he sends us. Thanks be to God. Let's go out with number 669, verse 2. <clears throat> all your works with joy surround you, earth and heaven reflect your rays.